Hello and welcome to the MJ Cast. It's the 9th of April 2015 and today we are extremely lucky to have a special guest on our uh, show. We've got a great episode lined up for you guys. This is our second MJ Cast special and we are so lucky to have uh, a gentleman here by the name of Kerry Anderson. Now Kerry is somebody uh, very prominent within the Michael Jackson community having worked with Michael uh, during the mid-2000s as Michael's principal bodyguard during a, a very tumultuous time in Michael's life which was actually uh, during his uh, his trial uh, against false child molestation allegations. Uh, Kerry was right there defending and protecting Michael through all of that, and we're very lucky to have him on the show today. So, Kerry, how are you? I'm doing outstanding, Jamin. Thanks for having me, and any time I can uh, do whatever to uh, just spread the uh, positive news about Michael's legacy, I'll do that, because there are so many people out trying to defame him still, as he rests in heaven. But to God be the glory, I'm going to do whatever I can do to uh, tell the truth uh, and to just continue, make sure his legacy continues as it should be. Absolutely, and that's what we're all about on the MJ Cast is about uh, documenting and discussing Michael Jackson's history and legacy uh, with people that knew him and worked with him, uh, just so we can get the truth out there. Because, uh, as you say, there are still a lot of negative things that go around in the press, but we just try to focus on those positive elements. Absolutely, I, I read something as late as today. There was some kind of um, something on Facebook regarding some kind of uh, thing regarding the Wade latest uh, crazy allegations, but like I said, I'm, I'm going to continue to do whatever I can do to tell the truth uh, about uh, Mr. Jackson and his, and, uh, you know, his immediate family, and uh, I'll be just more than happy to entertain questions that you have, or we'll just go from here. Absolutely. Well, we got a bunch of them. Uh, and we're, first of all, I just got to say how, how thrilled we are that we can have you on the show. I feel so lucky. We've tried to pull this together for uh, quite a few weeks now, haven't we? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Busy person. I'm a busy person. And uh, it's that's just how it is. But you know what? All things work together for good. And uh, it'll happen in God's time. And that's what I always say. That's right. Now, you've got a book coming out, don't you? Let's get straight to it. Uh, I mean, I first heard about you, actually, obviously, during the mid-2000s uh, when you were defending Michael Jackson and protecting him. But recently, I heard about you again when, when I found out that you've actually got a book coming out shortly. Can you tell us a bit about your book? Well, it, it's a book about my, my life experiences. Uh, it, it just so happened that God blessed me to be in the company of a, uh, one of the most famous individuals in the world. Uh, within that, but it, the book is going to shed a little light on what I did prior to Michael Jackson. I had a very exciting uh, life, a uh, very good life. I have a good family. I had a good law enforcement career prior to Michael Jackson, and it was just interesting how things lined up. So I'll go over the, the details of my younger life and then my professional life in law enforcement, what I did as an actual professional uh, that kind of streamlined me to getting into Michael's life, and um, that, that's about it. And, and obviously, I'll, I'll just share very uh, private moments that we had together as, as, as much as I can. I won't divulge certain things, but I think there's certain things that fans would like to know. I've been asked for several years to, to think about doing a book, and I never really felt it was the time, but now I, I feel it is, especially in light of uh, you know, people still trying to defame him and, and ruin his name. And uh, I'm going to be uh, doing whatever I can to in this book to just share some of the experiences and the private side of Michael that other people didn't know about. Absolutely. It just sounds so honorable what you're doing. And uh, we love to have as many uh, books come out about as, about Michael as we can get. Let's go right back into your history for a moment here. I would love to learn just a little bit about how you came to work for Michael Jackson to start with. Well, I was a policeman on the Los Angeles Police Department uh, for over 20 years. Uh, I had I worked a, a myriad of assignments, uh, gangs, uh, homicide. Uh, I worked canine unit for five years in our Metropolitan Division, which kind of spearheaded the, the thing. And then um, after the infamous, or I should say famous, uh, 1992 civil unrest with the Rodney King riots and all of that. We had a new chief of police 
well, all of the uh, chief of police in the major cities of of the nation really have executive protection teams that protect them and their families. And I was selected to uh, protect the police chief for his tenure while he was with the Los Angeles Police Department. When wow. I was selected, they sent us through a bunch of uh, executive protection schools, which are dignitary protection schools and same thing that Secret Service do, but we, we just do it a little differently and we take some uh, some of their experiences and just intertwine them and and then we create this guy. He's called an executive protection specialist. So that's what I did. And when I did that for the chief, uh, it was interesting. A lot of celebrities, it was like a breath of fresh air in Los Angeles to get a new chief of police with a new policing had been so crazy, kind of like it is in the nation now. And, and this guy brought in a breath of, a breath of fresh air. And uh, a lot of celebrities wanted to meet him. And I found out one day that the Jacksons and Michael wanted to meet him. So in order to meet the chief, actually, you always had to uh, come through us because whoever met with him, whatever level it was, uh, we didn't approve it or disapprove it. However, when the chief approved it, then we had to facilitate setting up the meeting with logistics and whether he was going to go there or there, whether they were going to come here. And, and they just happened to um, want to meet the chief of police. Uh, and uh, it was actually Michael, uh, the brothers, and I think Catherine came with them at the time. Wow. Um, but I had all, yeah, I had a mutual, a mutual, well, Michael's cousin, his blood cousin, is also a person in law enforcement in Los Angeles. And he and I had been, uh, worked for the same department several years prior to that. And he got word that I was in charge of the chief's security. So he contacted me, shared with me that the Jacksons wanted to meet Chief Williams and his family. And we facilitated that. And that's actually how I met. Um, uh, that, that's how the chief met. And, and we kind of like rekindled. Now, Randy and I had met prior to that on just a fluke kind of thing. I saw a real pretty Ferrari sitting on the side of a street <laughs> that it was like it's kind of out, out of place it was a beautiful car and i just u-turned i was in a black and white in uniform and i just u-turned and got behind it just to check it out and it was not a criminal kind of thing it was just more like admiring it i had never yeah. seen this car in my life the first year the uh, ferrari testarossa came out wow. and it was actually two no it was wow. one one ferrari testarossa parked on the side so I got behind it, looked at it, and as I'm walking around it, some guy starts running towards me and, and was begging me, no, don't cite it, I'm getting ready to move it, and that just happened to be Randy Jackson. Well, that's how Randy and I met. I think that was in 1986. That's how we actually met. And I told him I wasn't citing the car, I was just admiring the car, and he was, like, relieved, you know. And he said, yeah, well, this building here is a Ferrari dealership. It just doesn't have any insignia or logos or anything on it because of theft problems. They don't want people to know. And he actually had driven his other Ferrari in the garage or, or somebody had dropped him off or something like that. But he was down there checking on it and he came out to uh, meet me. So we met. We exchanged numbers. Uh, he asked me, what, did I want to go for a ride? And we went for a ride in it, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it was great. And we just hit it off and we, be we became, yeah, Randy and I became friends. Um, and then he lost, con we lost contact, you know, uh, you know, these guys like this, like Randy and some of the, 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 uh, Jacksons, uh, they change cell phones pretty frequently when the wrong person gets there cell phone number and then I changed divisions and I had changed cell phones a couple of times as well so we lost contact with each other so when this new chief of police came in um, I was the actual one who facilitated that meeting and I hadn't seen Randy in like three or four years then uh, maybe even a little bit more because I think I met him in like 86 and then I didn't meet him I didn't see him until 90 Three, 1993 that's when he met the chief yeah him tito jermaine catherine and jackie came up and we met the chief of police and uh it was just interesting that was the spearhead of it 
and uh, that that's actually how it started. That's how we we actually met with with Michael Jackson. Uh, he's got a long history of appreciating law enforcement. I mean, if you look at a lot of the music videos he actually put out uh, over the years, uh, he's got a bunch of different videos that he would shoot when on tour with the local law enforcement um, you know, officers of different cities that he would go to, and he would incorporate that footage into a lot of the work that he put out. He would stage huge marches with law enforcement officers that he'd be in front of in different cities, and it's clear that he had a big respect for law enforcement um, all the way through his career. Well, he did. And, you know, one thing that I hate that is uh, he is so misrepresented. That's another issue with the book. I want to tell the truth about Michael Jackson, the man, the father, uh, the philanthropist, the nice guy, the shy guy, the, the, the guy that is kind of afraid to ask a girl out on a date kind of thing, <laughs> even at in 2005, that kind of thing. And I also want to share with you uh, how he, he was raised with his moral scruples and values. He respected law enforcement. Michael wouldn't hurt a flea. You know, I, I told uh, one person uh, in some interview I was doing how, uh, you know, he, 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 he wouldn't allow us to have weapons, you know, uh, at Neverland, or he didn't want weapons around him. Very law-abiding person. You know, each and every one of us have imperfections in life. We all do. Um, but as, as it relates to his morals, his scruples and his values and the, the values and morals and scruples that his family and his parents instilled in him, Michael Jackson, as well as his family members are law abiding, productive members of society that just happen to be the most talented entertainer ever. As far as I'm concerned, Absolutely. You know, people would challenge that, but I welcome the challenge. You put any name up against him entertainment wise you know the whole package and he's he's it you know but as far as him respecting the law and being law abiding and being a good person with moral scruples and values and an amazing heart you can't find a better person and That's like right. i said this is one of the things that i want to share with the world and you know i i'm not i'm just speaking i'm not trying to make money or anything matter of fact this thing is costing me money right now but um i'm looking at just trying to get the truth out. You know, one of the things that a true friend will do, no matter what costs you, it, it, no matter what it costs, is when someone's trying to hurt a friend, you know, you, you stand up for them. You, you, you don't remain silent, you know. So that's, I, that's what I'm going to do. And as, as long as I can, uh, that's what I will do. But as far as Michael being, you know, loving law enforcement and respecting law enforcement, uh, he was a law-abiding citizen. Um, so let me take you take you back to the mid two thousands. How did you come to work for him as uh, you know a bodyguard in, in the mid two thousands for the trial? Oh, okay. Well, um, as you know, Michael changed attorneys. Uh, he went from whoever the guy was before to Tom Mesro. Thank God. <coughs> Excuse me. Tom Mesro had a whole different. Uh, philosophy on tackling this big beast that he was ahead of. Um, and one of it was he had to, first of all, the nation of Islam was in charge of Michael's security. When Michael stood up on top of the car, do you remember that incident when he came out of court and then he stood up on top of the car? And, Absolutely. That was during the You arena. remember that? Or yes, no? I do. Right. Okay. Well, when Tom Mesereau took over counsel and was, and was responsible for vindicating, uh, Michael, he wanted a whole different, first of all, you, you, he, his philosophy was we have to have a total different representation of Michael Jackson in and out of the court. This is a predominantly white conservative area, Santa Maria. The jury pool would be coming from a conservative white uh, jury pool, which means we cannot go up there with the nation of Islam uh, working in concert with, there were several law enforcement agencies that were involved in securing this whole thing. Well, the Nation of Islam didn't want anything to do with them. They move, they, they, they don't want any involvement with law enforcement in terms of dealing with their client, which was Mr. Jackson at the time. Well, um, when that new uh, philosophy was told to Michael, well, Randy became uh, like, 
I think it was Michael's head of everything. It went from Jermaine to Mike to Randy. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. So Randy knew me and he knew I was a law enforcement professional. Right. Tom Mesero wanted a person that could go up to the law enforcement agencies prior to the court, prior to the trial starting and liaise with all of the local law enforcement guys to kind of change what was done in the arraignment. Because like I said, I don't have anything against the nation of Islam, but they didn't, they didn't gel with the law enforcement that was up there. That's all. I'll just leave it at that. Well, I had to go in prior to and introduce myself as a law enforcement professional, uh, tell them, meaning all of the law enforcement agencies that we were going to be dealing with for three or four months up there, that I'm representing Mr. Jackson. We want to work in concert with you guys. He has certain requests that uh, he wants, but I also am a law enforcement professional and I understand your side. So I'm liaising between the two of you. And I went up there and met them uh, as per uh, Tom Mesereau's request. And we sat down and work out, worked out everything logistically on how we were going to get Michael from Neverland throughout the communities, all the way throughout the city, throughout the, uh, to the actual trial because that was something logistically with all the fans and the people chasing us on the freeways every morning and the helicopters. And it was a logistical mess. So we wanted to work in concert with law enforcement. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't want to infringe upon Mr. Jackson's uh, uh, privacy or anything like that, but I did want to utilize the resources of law enforcement to help us with getting us in and out of the court. Absolutely. You know, it was a security nightmare. It was a pedestrian and a, as well as traffic nightmare. And you'd be surprised what fans will do. Uh, not only fans, you, you also had people out there that, you know, hated Michael. They, they wanted to harm him. So uh, it was kind of difficult to discern when you're dealing on a freeway with several lanes of traffic, you know, who's the bad guy. And I knew several of the fans. I knew who some of the good guys were, but I didn't know everybody at the time. So, like I said, we met with uh, law enforcement. That was my job to liaise with them, representing Mr. Jackson as his director of security. And I would go up there and just take on a whole new uh, philosophy. We wanted to work with the law enforcement up there as opposed to being a separate entity uh, and not obeying anything that they said. So that's what I did. I met with them and uh, I told them some of Mr. Jackson's wishes, Mr. Masaro's wishes, and we worked it out. They told me some of the things that they wanted to do, and, and uh, it was give and take a little bit. But they respected me as a law enforcement professional, and, and we worked it out. So that's that's how that actually started. Um, so Randy got wind that I was available, and he called me, and the rest was history. My, I met Michael one day. It was interesting, because I think it was like January when they called me for it, and Randy called me and says, well, we're going to be leaving in a couple of days. And I didn't hear from him for like a month. I'm thinking, well, maybe this is not going to, you know, materialize. But it ultimately did. And they called me you know, after I hadn't heard anything for a month and said, OK, we're going to go tonight. It's like, really? You know, <laughs> and he said, be, be ready to be gone for three, three months. And I said, OK, well, three months is OK, you know, because I knew I'd be I thought Michael was somewhere in Bel Air, California, which was only like. 20 minutes from my house so he put me up in a hotel or whatever or I could commute uh, from home and into his house all the time but no we went we went to Florida for three months which turned into six months something like that it was it was long wow yeah that's how it started I uh, got the call from Randy and I ultimately uh, was told to meet Michael at this house and Randy was supposed to meet me there he wasn't Randy was like three hours late so when I pull up to this big, palatial, beautiful home, I tell them who I am, and there's some kind of security guy there, and they were expecting me, and but I was expecting Randy to be there. You know, nobody wants to go in and meet Michael Jackson <laughs> alone on the first time, and you hear he's so shy and all. It's like, you got to be kidding me, you know? So I'm calling Randy, and he's, oh, yeah, I'll be there in a few minutes. He didn't show up for like three hours, you know? So anyway, I, I go into the house, and... Uh, I open, they open the door and I, the first person I meet is one of the cooks, uh, Rudy. And, uh, Rudy says, come on in and just sit right here. Mr. Jackson will be with you. And then 
Here comes uh, Paris Prince Blanket and Michael Jackson. <laughs> They're so warm, so friendly, they, and they, they knew my name. So obviously Randy had spoken highly of me prior to my arrival, and um, it just worked out fine. Man, they, I mean, it was kind of like, you can imagine, I had the same feeling you had. You're meeting Michael Jackson. You know, I still got to remain professional and everything because I'm there to do a job, but it's still Michael Jackson. I've been a fan. I'm sure I'm older than you, but I've been a fan all of my life, you know. <laughs> so uh, to see Michael Jackson walk around the corner, you know, in his uh, nice, beautiful, just leisure clothes, it was like, wow, this is surreal, you know. Absolutely. But they made me feel so warm that the kids were so mannerable. Pr Prince came up. And Michael said, say, say hi to Carrie. And they shook my hand and, and Paris shook my hand. It's like, oh, these little kids are so cute. <laughs> and um, that was that. And then they, the kids were eager to get off and, and go run and play in the house. And Michael uh, and I just sat down and talked for like two hours before Randy even showed up. And we got to know each other and we just talked about things. And he made me feel real comfortable. I, I just, it was kind of uh, surreal. I didn't really believe it, but couple of times I had to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming or something, you know, but <laughs> it was awesome. He made me feel welcome. Um, he was kind of as shy as I was. He was very inquisitive about what I had done in the past in terms of shootings and, you know, all kind of police story stuff. He was inquisitive about that. And a couple of times it was like, oh my God, I hope I didn't answer wrong, you know, but I'm, I'm, this is it. I, I I've done certain things i've been exposed to certain things certain deadly situations and this is what you have i'm the nicest guy in the world but i can be a beast i've been through it you know so that's right um i think he liked that i think he liked my genuine uh just down to earth uh behavior or demeanor and uh he knew i could turn it on and turn it off i'm not a large guy you know sometimes you have uh protection guys that are very massive, just large, and uh, that's not me. Um, just a little bit earlier, you referred to yourself uh, during your time with Michael as director of security, and you've actually told me before that you feel like the term bodyguard is actually a little bit limiting for what you had to do for Michael. Uh, aside from like liaising with uh, law enforcement and then actually you know, providing security for Michael. What did your role entail? Even even outside of the trial, what what did your your role entail in protecting Michael? Well, uh, you know, as an executive protection specialist, your, your whole thing is to protect the client at all costs. Obviously, from physical harm, but you also don't want them to be embarrassed. It could be things as as simple as did if he's a male. Is his pants zipped up <laughs> uh, as we're walking down the street? I, I kid you not. I kid you not. I could tell you some stories about uh, presidents of the United States and certain embarrassing things like that happening and people would lose their jobs behind that kind of thing because you, not only are you supposed to protect him from physical harm, but you, he, he's not supposed to be embarrassed. So uh, whether it's walking down the street and there's a raise in the sidewalk and he trips over it, that shouldn't happen. Uh, whether he's got a stain on his uh, clothing or something like that that he doesn't know about, that shouldn't happen. Whether he's got a zipper that's unzipped or a button that he, you know, is, is not buttoned properly or something's misplaced, he's got food or something on his lip. Uh, God forbid he had something hanging from his nose. But these are all real life <laughs> things that that's right, yeah. executive protection people, yeah, you're supposed to do that. Not Not only that, you're also supposed to prevent things from happening like uh, frivolous lawsuits. So you do things that your experiences have told you and, and in the past with working with other clients and, and just lawsuits and stuff that we talk about in training, uh, people that uh, just come up with frivolous lawsuits. Hmm. Uh, you, you do things to prevent that kind of thing. And sometimes, especially dealing with Michael, that, that, that old statement about where well, you hear people talk about how he was a kid and you never had a childhood. Michael was older than I was. He was two years older than I was or a year older than I was. But he was like a kid. So little things he'd do, you know, food fights and stuff and just silly things that could eventually cost him some money. You know, you want to prevent litigation. 
Uh, a couple times, Michael wanted to go to certain uh, malls and he wanted to go right away. Well, you got to wait. You got to give me some time to prepare for this, to notify people and to let them get reinforcements that come in because you are not a regular shopper. When you walk into a mall with, you know, 2,500 or 5,000 people in it, you can imagine what's going to happen when Michael Jackson walks in a mall. Absolutely. You know, and especially with social media. Because people would, you, you know, hey, Michael Jackson's down here. Yeah, right. And then when they shoot a picture of him, you know, the cavalry's coming because now those people are going to believe it and the tweeting and everybody's coming down now. So not only do you have a problem in the mall, you got a problem with the neighborhoods emptying because they're all coming down to see Michael Jackson in the mall, you know. And you'd be surprised how uh, we could be in one section of a mall and, and something happened in the other section, but they blame it on Michael Jackson was here. So that's litigation. That's why, you know, happened, we're going to yeah. sue Michael. Exactly. So we have to prevent all kinds of things. And that's why I, uh, you know, sometimes when you have the bodyguard, there's negative uh, connotation that comes with that. Some people call the big stupid bodyguard. Well, executive protection specialists are not stupid. They are some of the highly, most highly trained people that they usually come from law enforcement background. Some of them are law enforcement as well, well as they have so much court time, they, they can practically be lawyers. You know, Tom Mesro and I had a well of a time at, at the actual trial. You know, certain things that I would see as a law enforcement professional because I've testified in court so many times and I've seen how juries work. I've seen what gets people convicted and what gets people off. You know, so I would tell him, Tom, you know what? You missed this question. Shoot this question in there. And, it's, I, you know, obviously he did his job, but there were little things that I would tell Tom Mesra, like, hey, what about this? I, don't, I think if you dwell on this a little bit, you know, uh, you might have missed this. And, and somebody else didn't pick it up. And I told him, you know, and uh, it, it was great. But we have a lot of responsibility. Like I said, it's not just the physical protection you have to know when to use and when not to use force. You have to know how much force to use because you can really get into a lot of trouble. And you've seen it in the past where bodyguards, I think they got a couple of guys pending. Uh, I know Chris Brown and his uh, bodyguard got, both of them got booked for something. And I think it had something to do with the excessive force that the bodyguard used while he was doing certain things you know obviously it's my job to physically protect you and i have to use the same kind of force that's reasonable and necessary to overcome the resistance of somebody trying to hurt my client but I, it has to be reasonable and necessary i can't because somebody takes a picture and you know michael doesn't want that picture i can't go up and just take the camera and beat the guy up you know there's there's ways of getting that camera you know usually it's hundred dollar bills or, or it like, you know what, Mr. Jackson wouldn't want that one, but you know what? You'll be more than happy to, if you just give me that film, you know, we'll give you several pictures and we'll autograph them, give you books and whatever, you know, and, and I could get that camera without using force. But if you got somebody that can't think on his feet and is that the typical big six foot eight, 350 pound bodyguard full of muscles, and it's just going to go up and like, give me that camera and I'm going to get it because my guy wants it. Well, you still got to follow the law, you know. So it, it, there's a lot to executive protection. And like I said, sometimes there's just a negative connotation with the the dumb bodyguard kind of thing. I just didn't like that. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And we and I, I just yeah, thought that was absolutely. fascinating the yeah, way that I you described that. So thank you. Um, also, I wanted to just, before we go back to the trial, because there's, there's certain things I'd like to ask about that. But before we go back there, you mentioned to me once in one of our conversations about the process that you had to go through in just preparing a simple visit to, say, a mall, for example. What was actually involved in just preparing a visit to a shopping center or a mall? for Michael Jackson and his team of people? Anywhere you move, this is another thing about uh, a trained executive protection specialist. Uh, you have to do route surveys, meaning the, the route, the actual route that you're going to take from where you pick up your client, which is usually his residence or hotel, to where he wants to go. And if it's 10 miles, you got to have, you got just got to check certain things out. You have to have alternate routes because of traffic depending on how many people in your entourage, you, you, you got to know how to drive. 
You got to uh, know how to trail each other. You got to uh, identify areas where uh, potential uh, people that have death threats on him would be a potential problem. High rise places, you know, uh, places where they could be concealed. Um, that's the actual route survey. Uh, you also have to keep in mind, I always had, Michael really didn't go too many places without Paris Prince of Blankets. So I had young children and you have to have a medical emergency plan. What's going to happen if one of the kids gets sick? Where are we going? How many hospitals are on your route? Or what's the closest hospital? It may not, you may not want to go to the closest hospital if it's not a trauma center. If it's not the best hospital, you might want to drive seven miles away as opposed to five miles away to the closest one because it's a better hospital. So you have to identify all these kind of things on your route survey. Your site survey is what you actually have to go through and check out uh, when he he's going to the mall. OK, the mall, you have to do a site survey. Uh, you got to know where the bathrooms are. You got to know where the stores that he frequents. Michael would never go into a mall that had a sharper image store. He'd always go to it. And um, you have to identify certain stores that he likes. You have to make contact with the law enforcement or the security people at the actual site. Because you can imagine what happens to a mall when Michael Jackson shows up. So you want to have you want to ensure that you did your due diligence with letting the local, uh, the, the actual on-site mall people going, if, if your site is actually a mall, you want to give them a heads up on what's coming because it's going to be chaotic. You know, I remember one experience that I had. Well, this guy, I kind of told him that I was bringing in a uh, high-profile celebrity, and I was just, I introduced myself, and I told him I just wanted to snoop and poop around, and I wanted to let him know that if people were uncomfortable with me you know, just walking around, checking out bathrooms and, and just kind of maybe looking suspicious. I was just looking for certain things and I might be in certain places that the normal shopper wouldn't go because I'm doing my site survey. I just told the head of security. I, I usually act, ask them to come with me so that there won't be any problems. But sometimes they get too busy or they don't believe you like this guy didn't. And I said, well, if you don't mind, I'll just go around if, you know, you're too busy. He says, oh, yeah, we, we have celebrities in here all the time. And I said, oh, okay. So I did my site survey at the mall, and uh, I knew it was going to be a problem because it was so crowded. A lot of young people, and uh, it was just very crowded and in a big mall. And then uh, Michael didn't like to also have a lot of bodyguard guys types around him. He wanted to be... He was like very inclusionary and he wanted to be with the people. But yet and still, it, it takes a lot of expertise to do that because, yeah, I'll give you your space, but you're still Michael Jackson. You know, and not only are you Michael Jackson, you got two, you got babies with you. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I got to have some kind of personnel around, you know. So anyway, there's the route survey. There's the site survey. Well, when I finished my site survey at the mall, which, like I said, encompasses Checking where restrooms are. You got to know where uh, your escape routes are in case it gets out of control. And you got to, what I would do is just kind of do a diagram and uh, I'd have certain escape routes. I'd uh, talk to stores, talk to the management at stores that I knew we were going in. And um, I tell them that I'm bringing a, excuse me, a high profile client in and, uh, you know, depending on what Michael wanted to do, I, I would make certain requests. You know, sometimes I would ask them to uh, let me control the video, the security. And, I, you know, because uh, a lot of times people, Michael wouldn't want to be videoed in a store shopping because of past experience. People would take, we, as soon as we leave the store, they take the videotape and go and sell it to Star Magazine and show him shopping with his children or something like that. And he really didn't want that. So. Yeah. I, yeah, I talked to those people and I and I shared with them. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be very good a very good month for you here in shop. I guarantee you. So, you know, monetarily it is because usually what he spends is going to be astronomical. You know, and you're going to have a good month in sales. You know, so if you would just bend the rules a little bit and turn your cameras off and and I had to ensure that I learned that the hard way. I had to ensure that those cameras were off. Because sometimes they say they were off and they weren't off, you know. So that, that's all a part of the site survey. And uh, it was amazing. I, the guy, 
that I met, uh, he didn't respect me at all. And he didn't think I was, I guess, telling the truth that I was going to bring a high profile celebrity. So I actually at the tail end of my site survey on that particular uh, mall run we were going to, I asked him, I came back by his office and I asked him, by the way, you said you had celebrities in here. I said, who have you had in here that, that you said is a big celebrity? He said, oh, we just had Jessica Simpson in here. And I couldn't, I know she was, I knew the name, but I didn't know who it was. But I'm like, you have no idea what's getting ready to happen. Because that is not a Michael Jackson, you know. And uh, so what I did in that case, because of, I wanted to prevent litigation. Instead of contacting him, because I knew he wasn't going to be any help. Because he didn't believe I was bringing anybody. And he didn't bring in reinforcements or anything like that. So I called the police the local police, and I told them exactly who I was. I got a name. I got numbers. And see, these are things later on that will prevent litigation because I did my due diligence in telling you, you are going to have a crowd control problem. I'm bringing Michael Jackson down here to the mall, um, and there's already, you know, 10,000 people in here. So you're going to need some help because this mall security guy doesn't really understand what is happening? What's going on? So exactly. I would call the police department, get a number. I'd get names and badge numbers and all of that stuff. So when it does get out of control, you can't call me later on and say it's Michael Jackson's fault because we didn't have enough security. Well, it's not my job to secure a mall. It's my job to secure Michael. It's the police's job and the director of the mall security's job to, to do that. And just because they failed to and they didn't believe me, I have names, I have numbers, I have locations that I contacted you. So, I, you know, that would uh, reduce the litigation on our part if you generated a lawsuit saying that we it was our fault, you know. So that's the route survey and the site survey. And that's pretty much it, you know. Uh, you just try to think of uh, everything from your past experiences and all of your training. And uh, another part of the site survey is the vehicles. What are you going to do? When people see Michael Jackson get out of a car, quite naturally, they, they'll start running and, and, and they know he's coming back to that car. Well, you have to do certain things with the car. So that's a part of it, the parking, you know. Um, so it's it was just an interesting time. But those, these are all things that you're trained to do. And if you don't, you're just a big guy, a uh, big bodyguard guy that, you know, because you were you, you, because of your stature and you don't have any training, you, you can get hurt. You can get hurt physically and not only physically, but you can get your client hurt monetarily with litigation if you don't do your due diligence in your route surveys and your site surveys. Heads of state and dignitaries. You, I tell you what, when the president of Australia or the, or the president of the United States go somewhere, you can believe site surveys and route surveys are done. You know, I'm talking about um, I, you know, manhole covers are, are sealed. They check uh, mailboxes to ensure that if they're on the route. I mean, it, it's at a whole nother level, you know, um, but you can believe. Uh, we, I tried to extend the same kind of professionalism to Michael because of my training. Just one last question on malls, and this is a bit just one last light question before we kind of go into the, the second third of our interview, a little bit more of a serious tone with the trial. What kind of stores in malls did Michael actually like to go visit? Oh, Sharper Image, uh, Brookstone. These are all stores with gadgets. You know, they sell massage chairs and just electrical stuff, nice stereos. Uh, there's a B and O stereo system that he would always go to. It's very high end stereo places. And then, uh, oh, we frequented Toys R Us. You got to think he had children. Toys R Us. Um, uh, let's see, Best Buy. Well, see, I don't know if you, I'm mentioning these stores. I don't know if they have them in Australia. <laughs> we, we have a lot of those. You guys have. Okay, well, s stores where they sell electronics. You know, uh, televisions, screens, stereo systems, home stereo systems, cameras, uh, that kind of stuff. He loved that stuff. And then the kids, like I said, toys. Uh, you know, he, he would shop big time for toys. And um, that's pretty much it. You know, every now and then Michael and I would sneak out and uh, we would do jewelry kind of stuff. You know, but that was... 
that was a little bit more low profile because we didn't, as a rule, we didn't have the kids with us then. Yeah. You know, people. but he liked fine jewelry, very nice watches. And then from time to time, he would send me out because he didn't want to be bothered. It was such a, just a logistical nightmare for him to go out. And that was one of the sad parts. I'll get into it in my book is, you know, being a person that can't have, you don't have no privacy. You know, you talk about a person like um, the Queen of England or the President of the United States. You know what? Michael Jackson, you cannot put, and I, and I, I tell you what, when I went into some of the mountainous, nomadic areas of the Middle East, I'm talking about in the mountains, and you'd, you're riding in a nice brand new Range Rover off-roading. You can't even get to these places if you don't have a nice four-wheel drive. I mean, a real one, you know? <laughs> And uh, these people recognize this man. I don't care where I took him. I don't care where we were on the planet. If he got out, you were going to have a crowd control problem within seconds. And and the interesting thing about that is he didn't want a lot of people around him. His, his paranoia was so up, and rightfully so, uh, because of some of the things that had occurred to him in the past. He didn't trust anybody. You know, and it's a it's a it's a sad way to live. But like I said, I'll get more into that. I mean, I'm just trying to yeah. kind of stay in on your questions because I know in you want book. to get. Yeah, I'll get. I know you want to get certain questions in. So I, <laughs> you know, I could rattle on and on. So you got to kind of stop me from time to time. But no, that's okay. It's uh, not a problem at all. I will. I will it, get it was into something. Our, our next uh, portion, if you if you'd like, and that's just about the trial. I want to talk about when you protected Michael. This was actually, as we know now. Uh, one of the most difficult times of his life, absolutely. The press were hounding him, and it was probably one of the lowest points as well in terms of public opinion. Um, how was Michael emotionally coping with this, and how were you as a team actually coping with it as well? He was not coping with it well at all. It, it, it emotionally drained him. It was a broken man. And if you can imagine being a wealthy person being broken with a lie and they chose a lie that was so ugly you sexually abused a child you know everybody you go to prisons you know there's murderers that can survive but people that abuse children nobody likes them so they pick the perfect crime to frame him with you know and he was not dealing with it emotionally well at all i saw a man that was broken i has been um I think about seven months with him prior to uh, the actual trial, and we had very good times. He was in; we were in Florida, and we came back and went to a couple of other different places. But he was, um, even though he was preparing for his trial, and he was upbeat and he was confident, he became broken based on that trial and based on what other responsibilities he had. You know, a lot of people don't think, but he was a very uh, humane, loving, caring person. He cared for his staff. He knew that he was responsible for two or 300 employees and what was happening to his finances because of all this crazy stuff going on. And I'm talking about some big numbers, you know. Um, so he cared, and that, that was a concern of his. It was a concern of his that they were defaming him, and people would, were believing it because it was all on the media. And the power of the media is amazing. They can take a person like a Michael Jackson, who is a person with moral scruples and values, and demonize him into being some kind of satanic child molester. And then you can take a person that's a recidivist, that's a convicted uh, murderer more than once, and they go to prison and because they find the Lord or whatever, and they start writing children's books, they get nominated for the Nobel peace prize. And, and I'm talking, that's a legitimate fact, you know? So, um, it was affecting him tremendously. Uh, I think what also took, uh, a toll on his, uh, mental state in, in dealing with this was, um, uh, the rejection and, and the uh, standoffishness of his friends. There are some people that distance themselves from him because their PR person said, you know what, let's stay away from that. You know, and that, that's when you really show your true friend. It's like, you know what, okay, Mr. PR man, 
you're the PR man, but you work for me. That's my friend. I know him, and I know he didn't do that. I'm going out with him. And a lot of people didn't, didn't do that. And I understand how it is when you – and money is so evil. It, it really when – when a PR person says, you know what, I'm telling you, don't do this. Don't go out with him. Don't call him. Don't – you know, just distance yourself. And then you do that because you don't want to mess your money up when you're already rich, but yet your friend – is emotionally just drained and emotionally just getting beat up. You know, he feels he's been deserted by his friends and his peers, and yeah, it, it took a toll on him, man, you know. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, you know what they say, it, the love it, of it, money is the root of all evil. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, but, my, uh, look, my, sorry, Kerry, my, my next question for you is around something that you've spoken about in a previous interview I've heard. And uh, you mentioned that at one point during the trial, I think it might have been right at the very end, there was actually a, uh, a threat on Michael's life. Um, you know, to what extent did that threat leave him worried and, and yourself as well? There's just the team of people around him. Well, uh I wasn't worried. Uh, it's one thing about protection work. You you know the kind of uh, uh, danger that exists. If somebody wants to kill somebody and they are willing to die to do it, you can't stop that. All you can do is try your best to identify it and to prevent it. But like I said, you, 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 you just... Uh, anybody can assassinate anybody if they're willing to die. And... That's where your your expertise comes in. You you got to do certain things, and I, and I won't go into certain things that we did, but we did certain things to counter assault that. If any kind of threat were to come up, uh, we we had things in place to deal with it, and uh, and then the my ultimate protection was God, because like I said, there's only certain things you can do, whether you have weapons or not, and whether you have counter assault measures in place or not. Like I said, my ultimate protection was God, and, and Michael was on the same philosophy. He was a uh, Christian, and uh, I was also told that he was a devout Jehovah's Witness. But our, our ultimate protection came from God, and, and I believe God's angels were encamped around us, and uh, he ultimately protected us. But we definitely had a couple of viable threats earlier in the trial and definitely on the last day of the trial. And uh, I'll, I'll get more into more and more in detail about certain things that happened that really raised my eyebrows a little bit and <laughs> made me pray a little bit harder, you know, but, uh, Absolutely. just another great reason to look forward to your book, I guess. So some of that detail will be in there, I, I'd imagine. Oh, absolutely. Michael was obviously under an immense amount of pressure in his life. And in my opinion, that pressure peaked within the last decade um, of his life. Uh, to what extent would you agree that he had to shoulder a lot of pressure as an individual, not just a celebrity, but an individual? Oh, that pressure was uh, just immense, unbearable. I, I often told Michael that, you know, his resilience and his just being able to wake up and get up and get dressed for court was a demonstration of the strength and the resilience that he had because I saw what they did to him in trial. I saw s some of the things that they did to this man. And I tell you, to be financially uh, set and know that you can't prevent this from this thing from happening, you know, it's like, wow, this is something else, you know, but uh, it, it definitely took its toll on him. Uh, it impacted him tremendously. It, it was terrible. I, I, I tell you, it, it really was. Yeah. It was absolutely terrible. Just the, the immense, uh, not only the pressure from the, the media, but just also the pressure of being somebody that had so many hundreds of employees and a family and, and doing it as a single father. Yeah, the pressure was immense. I, I really, it, it really, uh, it was significant. Uh, and that that's kind of like an understatement. It's kind of hard to even imagine the pressure. I saw him uh, break down several times on the way to court. I saw him break down several times just when he shouldn't be breaking down. And I mean emotionally with, with tears and crying and fear. It just took its toll. Uh, you could just tell he was a broken man. Mm -hmm. You know, in spite of his wealth, in spite of his celebrity, it, it, it was he was just a broken man. And he tried not to, you know... Uh, have those kind of uh, breakdowns in front of children. But you'd be surprised. Michael and I, we had private moments and 
sometimes he would just call me and, uh, you know, we're hours too. Like, Carrie, you awake? Like, no, I wasn't, but <laughs> you know, what's, what, what's going on? You know, well, I'm, I, I need you to meet me over here. So we'd go for a ride at Neverland and, and it was just a thing where I would just try to encourage him and edify him and uplift his spirit. And I would always tell him, you know, man, you are an example of strength. You know, I don't know if I could go through all of this, but I'm telling you, you'll be OK. Uh, you know, we always would go on. Uh, I would give him the word of God because this was beyond anything that I could physically do. You know, when I said about the threats the pressures of the, the physical threats to his, his, his life and everything. It's like there's only certain things you can do, and then you have to get into another level, which is God. That, that is, that's my next level. People use other things to do to deal with other issues that they can't deal with, and I use God and, and you know, biblical principles and what God says. So I, I, when, when you do all you can do in the natural setting, then I got on into my spiritual side and Michael and I were of the same philosophy. And I just re reiterated to him that he was more than a conqueror. I said that God gives us the victory, you know, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. These are some of the scriptures that I gave him. I said that uh, he was a champion. Champions don't focus on where they are. They always focus on where they're going. You know, I, I, I wrote him all kind of things and he would tell me, well, tell me about this faith stuff, you know, and, Tell me about love and, and how you, uh, what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek. You know, we got into some serious conversations, but it really helped him. And it was like therapeutic because it was so much pressure. He was breaking down physically, mentally, emotionally. It was very tough on him. And he actually got sick several times. You know, what, what's amazing about that, when you're legitimately sick, this guy's you know, he's diaphoretic, he's perspiring, he's vomiting, and we, we got to be in court in 10 minutes. Well, I, because of my route survey, I know where the hospital is. We're going to the hospital. Yeah. You know, and you get to the hospital yeah. and the judge tells you, no, you better bring him to court. Like, you got to be kidding me. This guy is sick. Well, if he's sick, we have an infirmary here. It's like, oh, my God. Mm. Now, I got to go and tell him, you can't be sick. You can't throw up. You know, it's like, are you kidding me? It's amazing. And, oh, man, you, you have no idea. And then, you know, he's still a single parent. Yeah, he had staff at the place, but a single, you know, the staff, they go home. And you, you're a daddy. Michael was a dad. You know, at the wee hours when it's time for the staff to go home, he's a dad. He's cooking, he's changing diapers, and he's doing you know, serving dessert and stuff. He's a regular person, you know, and uh, that, that took immense that you talk about the pressure. It was unbelievable, you know? Yeah. So, so it's a real testament to how strong he was as a, as an individual being able oh to deal my with God. it. And, you know, I always say in spite of that, you know, I, I, cause I know that kind of pressure can take years off of your life. I know it does because, you know, it's something about pressure. It, you know, when you when you have stress, man, you, it can develop physical stuff like colitis, cirrhosis of the liver, all kind of uh, ailments can come on when you're dealing with those kind of stresses, you know. Yeah. And uh, thank God he didn't have any of that. And he still was able to muster up the strength from within, you know, deal with this stuff. I think it's important to remember as well that at the end of it all in, in 2005, there was a victory. There was a positive outcome. And uh, obviously when Michael was found innocent on a day that we as a fan community now celebrate as Vindication Day, it was one of the greatest moments in, in many fans' lives, really. And this feeling must have been magnified for Michael and his family and team and just and, and you as well. What was it actually like on June 13th, 2005 and the days after that? No, uh, it wasn't celebratory at all. Michael was in bad shape. Um, he was so afraid, um, even though I tried to encourage him and I tried to isolate him some, from some of the family members because they were very fearful and I didn't want, you know, uh, he to see them like that. I didn't want him to see them like that. And um, But it was very emotional uh, when I told him that uh, it was time. The verdict had come in. I'll, I'll get into some serious details about that particular day because up until the last minute, these people were still trying to screw him over. And it was so sad. Uh, like I said, I'll get into details of in the book of 
some of the little things that they did in trying to make us late and not notifying us the way they told us they were going to notify us. And it, it was amazing. Um, but the pressure was on Michael and, uh, it, it wasn't a good day at all. You know, when I mm. went up and, uh, told him the verdict, uh, was in and we had to get to court, uh, you know, post haste very, very soon. Uh, I wanted him to wear, um, a bulletproof vest because of the threat level that was on. And, uh, I put that vest on him and, I'm going to go into some serious detail of, of what happened that particular day, but it, it wasn't good. But we finally were en route to court, and that was an emotional day. And like I said, I'll get into details in the book on, on that yeah. particular day, what happened. Um, but it wasn't a good day at all. Even when uh, the verdicts came in, I was gr grateful to God that, you know, uh, the things that I had been telling Michael were – manifesting meaning his freedom but michael was in a state of shock mm -hmm. i still don't believe that he really realized what was happening because he was so emotionally physically and mentally messed up it was not it was just not a good day you know mm -hmm. i think he was just going through the motions but it's like when somebody you know guts you they they take all your cut your extremities off and they say okay you're 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 free so you're, you're still numb, like, you know, for from that six months of uh, what went down, that mental conditioning that they did, you know, it really impacted him. And uh, it wasn't celebratory at all on the way home. It was very somber, even though we won. You know, you see some of us embracing each other, some of the security guys, because we were just so happy that that part turned out and that he didn't get assassinated uh as the guy said he was going to do walking from the court, uh, you'll see my positions. If you look at videos closely, you'll see I close the gap on Michael. I, 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 my philosophy is that if you kill him, you got to kill me first. You know, so I didn't want him. We, we had we had our team much closer on him than we normally did, you know. And uh, thank God it all worked out, though. But it was a very trying day. It was celebratory for the, a lot of the fans and emotional. And thank God for them. But it was a terrible day for us. It really was, even though he was vindicated. Pretty pretty soon after the, the verdict, uh, you guys decided to go to the Middle East. Is that correct? Why, why did you decide to travel to the Middle East? Well, Michael basically was done with the United States. He... Um, didn't believe in the judicial system. He, he believed that they could do him like this again. And he was very fearful, you know, of, of what could potentially happen again. And, and, you know, some of his friends from other parts of the world opened their arms and said, that won't happen here. And uh, he decided to, um, you know, meet with his friend, Sheikh Abdullah. And, and that's, that's where we decided to go. And I guess Sheikh Abdullah assured him enough that that wouldn't happen again and you didn't have to worry about anything and it was great when we got over there it was so peaceful and you could tell michael was really in better shape once once we got over there yeah and what sort of places did you visit what countries did you go to there oh uh, we went to first of all we went to france and stayed there for a couple of weeks paris france and then we went to the middle east we went to bahrain uh dubai and Oman. Yeah, you mentioned about going to a, like a remote village in Oman. What, tell, tell me a bit about that experience. I mean, why, why did Michael want to go really remote into a, into a village in Oman? Oh, because the people that, uh, when they picked us up, some of the people when we arrived in Oman, we, the people that hosted us, uh, some billionaire kind of guys. As a matter of fact, when we left the airport, as we're going up this street, there was a Rolls Royce, Ferrari... Uh, Lamborghini and Bentley dealership and this particular family owned that but they were also uh, people that were considered nomads they lived they I guess certain times of the month they would go up in the mountains and live without electricity and running water because that was their culture I guess and my, they were explaining that to Michael and he was like oh I want to go so we, <laughs> we rode up there just like and I, I didn't really I wasn't feeling that because we were still dealing with the war kind of thing the middle east thing and it's like i'm thinking man we you know what you could become 
I don't know these people. I mean, let, let's don't go in the mountains. You know, let's stay in the city where at least we can run and get some help, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Michael was Michael. And when he wanted to do something, there was nothing I could do. And we went. But like I said, you, you start going up. And I'm talking about it, it didn't even look like it was so mountainous and so far away from city. And all you see is mountains and caves. And then you, and you know, you see a guy walking with a herd of sheep coming down the mountain. And like, what? Oh, myself, I'm thinking, what are we doing here? You know, it's <laughs> like I don't, I don't like this at all. But we did it, and people coming. Michael Jackson, like, oh my God! And that's what really <laughs> kind of showed me. It's like even these people know this man. Yeah. It's like, he oh, was, my God. He was, was a real amazing. international figure. You know, it doesn't matter where he went in the world. You know, he brought everyone together. Absolutely. Absolutely. So during that time in the Middle East, it's, it's you know, very well known that Michael was working on music um, during the period that you were, you were with him. Uh, did you see him working on anything or did he mention it to you? Was, was he passionate about uh, the return to art after the trial? Well, he was very, there were some business ventures that he was working on with, and I'll go into that in the, in the book. I won't get real specific about it, but yeah, they were working on music. The main thing that they were working on is they were doing a, uh, it, it was a kind of uh, multiple artists thing for uh, the Katrina uh, disaster, the, the Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, they were doing like a charity some single big, for Katrina, uh, yeah. Song. Right, right, right. They were doing that. And that's what it, that's what they were working on when I was there. Mainly, there was several artists that came in, and and um, then they did their computer thing where they do the tracks and all of that. But they were working on that very heavily when I when when we first got there. Yeah, unfortunately, that song it's actually called "From the Bottom of My Heart." It's it's a song that still hasn't been heard by the fan community. It's one of the biggest mysteries out about Michael Jackson is what that song actually sounds like. Oh, I've heard it before. Have you heard it? No, I've never heard it. I I actually don't think it's been leaked uh, it's or released awesome. or anything. Yeah, well, maybe it hasn't. Uh, I guess Shake Abdullah, I, I know he probably still has a copy of it, but uh, it was awesome, I tell you that. I wish it would be released, but I've never heard it. Maybe one day it'll come out. So what yeah. did you perceive Michael's relationship to be like uh, with, with the Prince of Bahrain? <laughs> Oh, it was very good. Um, I guess the latter part of it would, got strained when uh, after we left. But it was good while I was there. And then at the end of it, I guess it, it went south. But they, were still, they still had a good relationship uh, once I left. And uh, then Michael went to uh, Ireland. But, I, you know, Sheikh Abdullah opened up his home, his family. I saw their children interacting. Um, the gifts were amazing. They, they, we, they wined and dined, uh, Michael, they, you know, gave him houses, cars, they gave me cars, houses. Uh, and when I say that they always, I always had a nice place to stay in very close proximity to Michael. So they, they gave him everything. And I, I thought I was shocked when I found out that there was some kind of riff. Um, but that was after I had left, yeah. Michael went, yeah. So, I mean, reflecting back on your overall time with Michael, what, I mean, I know that you, you've told me before that you, you lived at Neverland, for example. What was it actually like living with Michael Jackson? What was he like as a guy at Neverland? You know, it was interesting because I had never worked for a client like that. First of all, that, of that magnitude. Secondly, uh, as a rule, clients would you wouldn't stay with the client, but this was a different setting because Michael didn't typically stay in hotels. He stayed at Neverland. And then when he did stay in a hotel, I was in usually a connecting room or something Yeah. because I told him, I can't protect you if I'm in the basement and you're 18 floors up on the pin. I can't protect you like that. You know, there's too many uh, variables that can happen. So, uh, it was amazing, man. Uh, my time at Neverland was, was great. It, Neverland was, it was so awesome. And he made me feel so welcome. And the staff made me feel so welcome. Quite naturally, I never want to infringe upon uh, a client's privacy. So I, I didn't really want to stay at Neverland, but he insisted that I stay at Neverland. And, and I did initially until a lot of uh, 
different people start showing up. And then I think Michael was working on several things because he had a couple of the uh, guest houses set up kind of like studios. He was doing some kind of something, recording or something. I, the equipment, I've never seen nothing like that. But um, he, he always made me feel very welcome. It was very peaceful, very serene. And uh, he had a lot of staff that had been there several years prior to me that knew how he worked, knew what he wanted, uh, knew the kind of music that he wanted playing throughout Neverland. And it was very peaceful and serene. All of the animals were there. Everything was live uh, and just vibrant, you know. And uh, it was amazing. I remember the first day I got there, uh, I woke up to what I thought was um, an elephant. <laughs> Uh, sound. I was like, wow, maybe I'm dreaming. And I, I know what I heard, though. And then I looked out of my beautiful little cottage that I was staying in right across from the main house. And there it was. It was an elephant walking around. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm looking at the zoo and I'm thinking, OK, he's going to have a little, you know, maybe a couple of little chickens and petting and geese. Man, this guy's got, you know, five or six giraffe. <laughs> I mean, and lions and tigers, and we had bears. We had Blue, the bear. Uh, we had Cricket, the horse. And uh, the little, he had uh, big Clydesdales as well as, uh, he had a little pony, a uh, little miniature horse called Cricket. <laughs> and um, just, I mean, things that you would see, it was amazing because I remember I took Paris and Prince and Blanket to the zoo when we were in Florida. Now, this is prior to going to Neverland. Uh, we were in Florida, I think, for like six months. And I took them to the zoo one day, and we got kind of a, a, the hookup. We got a private kind of tour. And every time I had gone to the zoo as a young child, I have never gone to some of the nice exhibits like the uh, silverback gorillas and some of the good animals you want to see. And they were, they were always in the cave when I was there. When I as a kid, so we take this private tour, and I know it was because of Michael. They were Michael's kids, but we got hooked up pretty good, and we're on this private little tram. It's just myself, blanket, Paris, Prince, and uh, Grace, one of the uh, one of Michael's uh, assistants, and um, we go to the uh, the various you know uh, displays or. or areas where they keep the animals and they're there and they're like, they just woke them up or something. I'm like, Hey Prince, look at that. That's a silverback gorilla. Cause I had never <laughs> seen one in captivity. He's like, every time I've gone to the zoo, he's never there. And, and I'm, I, we go to the next thing and, and Prince said, so, and it was a very interesting uh, response he had. I'm like, what do you mean? So that like, that doesn't turn you on. And when I got to Neverland, I knew why, because he had all of that stuff at Neverland. So right that was there. that was no big deal to Prince. Yeah, they weren't turned on at all by that. I think they just wanted to get out of the hotel we were staying in. And the zoo was nothing. They wanted to get to the souvenir shop. They didn't want to see those animals because their animals were, they had a zoo that would make that one look sick. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Neverland was awesome. It, it really was. Uh, do you have a heartwarming story for us about Michael as a father? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, heartwarming. No, not really. I, I there's several, but I um it was interesting just the way he interacted with his children. Um not heartwarming, it was kinda comical sometimes. They were they were very he was such a loving father. And uh you know, they would always do the typical uh whenever we would leave and go somewhere, they're fighting over who's gonna sit with daddy. <laughs> and it was always prearranged prior to us getting to the car, but invariably, Paris had to sit with her dad. And no matter whose turn it was, because what they did is they rotated it. You know, forget the child restraint stuff. Somebody was sitting in Michael's lap, one of those kids. And it's like, okay, that's... And I mean, we were in... Because we never really went a lot of places until we got to Bahrain. But when we got to Bahrain, we went a few times. But I, I guess they don't... Maybe they don't have child restraint stuff there. I, I don't know. But it didn't matter because 
Sheikh Abdullah had the, he was in charge of the military, the police and everything. So we could do what we wanted, but it was just interesting to see how the kids interacted. They, they love their dad so much and he loved them. And well, it was kind of comical the way Paris would get into it with both of her brothers over who was sitting in daddy's lap, you know, <laughs> and Michael would sit there and let them just go at it. No, I'm like, no, it's my turn. It's like, Oh my God, can we, let this go you know it's like wow but it was interesting to see him interact uh he was such a loving father he was such a you know a disciplinarian uh it cracked me up a couple times to see him a lot of people don't know how physically fit michael was i walked in on michael a couple times and he was doing uh martial art things kicks moves punches strikes it's like, wow, I didn't know you were. And he was really a Bruce Lee fan. And you could just see some of the movement. He was just mimicking Bruce Lee. But I tell you what, he was something else. And then a couple of times I would see him working out with his children. I walked into the gym, I would, especially when we got to uh, the Middle East. I would try to, because we were staying in the same uh, palace, like. And I would always try to get up very early because I knew they were going to work out too. But I would try to beat them in there. And one morning, they were in there prior to me getting there and Prince and Paris were running on a treadmill next to Michael. And that was just like, wow, if people only knew this, you know, That's awesome. I've seen uh, both of the kids and Michael awesome. doing sit-ups. They, you know what? He was amazing, an amazing dad, man. People don't understand how he cared for those children. You know, there were certain foods he didn't let them eat, you know, and it was a pain in the neck because Sometimes I had to go out and says, Carrie, make sure it doesn't have this, 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 and this in it. Like, okay. Um, like, wow, but these kids ain't going to like this stuff, man. It's like, but it was all health, you know, no fat, no carbs, no fructose or whatever. I, it was some thing called fructose. Uh, I forget what it was, but I, I think it was called fructose. If it had fructose in it, no matter how bad they wanted it, they couldn't have it. It's like, oh, my God, you know. But he really cared. Uh, for them. He was uh, just so loving, so caring. He made sure that they were scholastically just astute. Those kids were brilliant. That's why I always say in my interviews, you will hear from Paris, Prince, and Blanket. I guarantee you. Um, I mean, in the business world, if they decide to get into entertainment, they are smart. I'm telling you. Because that's all they did was study. He didn't let them watch TV. TV was like um, a, a treat, you know, and now they, they made movies and he taught them how to film and all of that. But as far as television, he didn't let them watch TV mm. as far as when I was around, that was like a no, no. And it was like, a uh, uh, that, that was like there. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna have TV night tonight. And I, I'm certain that he, you know, scrutinized what, what they watched. But he didn't let him. And I can imagine, you know, you got his dad all on TV and talking about him crazy. You wouldn't want your kid exposed to something like that, you know. That's right. But, and uh, I've, I've got one uh, final question for you, Kerry, before we, we talk about your book and when it might be coming out and all of that kind of stuff. I want to ask you what memory you have that you're holding closest to your heart after your time with Michael. When you look back on that, that era in the mid-2000s, what, what do you look back most fondly on when you, when you remember your time with Michael? Well, uh, Christmas was very special. Uh, he bought me a very special gift. It was very warm. He was always into Christmas. He was so giving. Uh, I remember another time at, at another Christmas, we were in the Middle East. He uh, had a truck come in, man, and we went to an orphanage. And, you know, I was, he was asking, where are the toys? Because the toys were kind of, they had a couple of tricycles, and, but they were old and beat up. And, and Michael was like, no, we're coming back. We're coming back tonight. <laughs> and we went to a store and basically de depleted the stock. I kid you not. And he came back to that orphanage with toys like you would not believe. And that, that, it's just like, wow, how could a man be running from his own country and be so misunderstood and misrepresented. And he's so loving like this, you know, and uh, I'll never forget Christmases were very just, they were a lot of fun because he loved Christmas, you know, uh, it was always beautiful trees and, and, and gifts. 
and uh, you could just tell it was a very happy time, you know, in the midst of the storm of his life. But those were some of the key moments that I remember were uh, Christmas, you know, spending Christmas with him. And, and it was it was awesome. It really was, you know. Incredible. I always loved how he interacted with his children. He was just a family man. If people could really, you know, uh, picture Michael Jackson not on stage and being a good dad, that's exactly what he was, you know. Amazing. So... Kerry, to wrap things up, you've got a book coming out soon. Uh, when when can we expect it roughly to come out? Well, I initially wanted it to come out uh, June 13th. That's not going to happen because I've gone into some, I'm having some personal problems. And uh, if all anybody ever listens to this, just please continue to pray, pray for my parents. They're uh, getting up there in age and they're, uh, they've had some medical challenges lately that has kind of gotten me sidetracked and quite naturally there's nothing more important to me than them including this book uh, because it's it's weighted the, the book hasn't come out in 10 years so it'll all happen in God's timing I, I I initially like I said I wanted it to come out on the 10th anniversary of his vindication of those um, child molestation charges but uh, that's not going to be the case so I, I'm not going to put a date on it because I don't want to put a date on it and then something else happens uh like like i say right now my parents are my priority so i've kind of been sidetracked a little bit but it'll come out in in god's timing and it is going to be well worth the read you won't be able to put it down once you pick it up especially if you love michael jackson Absolutely. and even if you don't like michael jackson i'm going to tell the truth but it, it's going to be the truth and whether you like him or not you know um i gotta be honest with my book and some of the things i share and for the people that would say, well, you're trying to make money. No, I'm not trying to make money. I'm just trying to uh, do what I can do to continue a man's legacy that should be uh, represented properly. Because I don't believe it is uh, right now, you know, with all this frivolous new allegations. And I just feel that, you know, the, the, the Bible always talks about give honor to whom honor is due. And I think he is due honor for what he did as a entertainer as a father as a uh, productive member of society as a philanthropist still to this day there i don't think there's any celebrity that has given more than michael jackson monetarily you know i've seen that man empty stores out and it breaks his heart when we were in that orphanage just to see him like where are all the toys and you know the people would show him these beat up toys like oh no and we, he cut his visit short to go and shop and come back. And the kids were, you could just tell, they were just mesmerized to see this truck pull up and, you know, you'd, you'd give them a gift and it was like, is this mine? Yeah, it's yours, you know? So he was an amazing person, man. And uh, I just hate that his life was so short. We've lost so many amazing people in this world. They had short lives, it seems, you know? But he was definitely one and... Uh, you talk about gone too soon. He was definitely one. That's right. Gone too soon, you know. I mean, this book coming out is something incredibly exciting for the fan community. People are looking forward to it. But, uh, you know, just for me, you know, I just think, you know, take all the time you need, not only just to be with your family, which is the most important priority, but just to make sure that this book is right and how you want it to be when it does come out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate that. I, I really do. I want to focus all my attention on it. And right now it's divided because it's been broken with with my parents and I love them so much. And, you know, I, I just ask that uh, those of you who pray, just continue to pray for them. Yeah, they've been here for 76 years and 75 years. And it's kind of selfish when, uh, you know, that's a long time to be on this earth, you know, <laughs> especially now. But you still want them around. They're your parents. You know, you don't want to see them ail or get ill in any kind of way. So, uh, like I said, in, in God's timing, the book will come out. Uh, I believe all things work together for good. It doesn't say all things are good, but they work together for good for those who love the Lord. And I love the Lord, and I know Michael loved the Lord. So it'll be out when it's supposed to be out. You know, sometimes we don't know why certain things happen, that unexpected delays, but like I said, I wanted it to come out June 13th, but I think God had other plans, and obviously he has. So it'll be out when it's out, and I, that's all I can say at this point. But it's going to be definitely well worth the wait. 
Absolutely. Kerry, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the MJ cast. This is something we've been working towards for quite a while. Uh, you've been an amazing, amazing guest. I feel honoured that you could come on the show and, and share your experiences uh, with Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure, so thank you. Well, thank you, Jamin, and any time I can uh, do it again, I'll be more than happy. Uh, like I say, I, I think, uh, I not think, but I know... Uh, Michael would be very displeased with certain things that he's seeing in the world now. A lot of that's one of the other things that we'll talk about uh, in the book, and why I wanted to do this interview is that, you know, Michael, he was definitely a voice for the voiceless. You look at his music, and if you just go back on some of his songs, man, it's like he would see certain things that are happening in this world with war and unjust things that are happening in law enforcement and. Um, the levels between the rich and the poor are getting wider, you know, and it's like uh, he would be unhappy with that. So we want to get the, the book out, and uh, I just want to continue his legacy to the best of my ability. Uh, I definitely want to thank you for giving me the platform and the forum to, to speak with you guys. And by all means, if, if, if I can do it again and you want to do another one, just call on me and I'll... I'll uh, definitely do it great well we're going to keep the fan community uh updated we're going to let all of the uh mj cast listeners know exactly uh when this book's coming out as developments happen uh we'd love to get you back on the show maybe you know after the books all uh come out and, and it's in people's hands and they're reading it maybe we could get you back on the show to have another talk about it once i've had a chance to read it as well uh we might wrap things up here now kerry and uh, guys, just all our listeners out there, if uh, if you want to contact Kerry, uh, there's a few ways you can you can find him. You can find him on Facebook. Kerry, where where should people uh, go to learn a bit more about you and your book and, and to hear all the news that it's coming out about your your uh, material? Well, it's on Facebook. It's uh, entitled Agape Love, uh, Agape, which is the unconditional love of God, and uh, that's what Michael was all about. Uh, no matter what color you are, no matter what your socioeconomic background is, uh, the big thing was to love and, and agape. It's A G A P E, love, uh, forward slash K. Uh, oh, it's www.facebook forward slash agape love. And uh, you can also reach me on Facebook. Uh, you know, I have all kind of friends and fans, and uh, if you got any, not fans, but fans of Michael who, who you know kind of became friends of mine but you can re reach me also on Facebook on uh Carrie Anderson Carrie T Anderson that's right. We'll put a link to your uh, accounts in the show notes as well so that people can follow those and uh, friend you and find out more about your book. We'll be promoting it as much as uh, we can as well. Guys, uh, that's the end of our show for today. Uh, we've had a great chat with uh, Kerry Anderson. It's been an amazing experience. Uh, I can't thank him enough for being here. Uh, just remember, if you want to hear more episodes of the MJ Cast, the best way to find us is to go to www.themjcast.com. You can find lots of podcast episodes there of us talking about Michael Jackson news, but also uh, special episodes where we, we talk to people that knew and interacted with Michael uh, in a professional way. Uh, so again, thank you so much uh, for tuning in and listening to the MJ cast, uh, and we'll see you next time. Keep Michaeling. <laughs>